Um, so chapter 11, function operators, it's uh, the number three chapter of the functional programming section of this book. So here's what we're gonna do today. Uh, I'm gonna look at the definitions first, what are they? And there are two uh, existing function operators, uh, namely per safely and memoize. And then um, we're gonna make our own uh, functional operators. Since this was a really short chapter, I'm gonna try and go really slowly, uh, but per safely was my main focus this, uh, uh, in this chapter. And then I did some uh, little tweaks to what Hadley did with his uh, own functional operators. Okay, so functional operators is uh, something that you feed a function in and then output a function. So you see here chapter nine and 10, uh, sham cover functional, which is you feed in a function and you output a vector such as per map, you know, you feed in a, a per map, map over a list and you sum it and then you get a nice vector out of it. That's a functional and function factory is what Brett covered uh, chapter 10. Uh, you feed in a vector and uh, get a function as an output. For example, uh, box Cox transformation based on the lambda value, which is a numeric vector of length one, you get something, uh, uh, some transformation function or scales uh, package is another great, exa great example. But today uh, function operator is um, you feed in a function to get another function. So chatty function that's covered in the book is as follows. Um, so the main action goes on here. So in the initial call, you pass in to the chatty another function, which is basically a square. Uh, my func is a square. And then you pass it into the chatty as an F, and then it gets evaluated here. Um, you force the evaluation right away so that lazy evaluation doesn't uh, throw you off. And with that function that you passed in, um, you return another function that uses f, our function that's feeding in, to a future argument x with any further dot, dot, dot arguments. What, what's nice about this is you, while you do the, do the actions that you uh, pass in, you can do other stuff like printing, uh, uh, printing a statement. So I'm feeding in whatever, and I'm returning the result of the uh, function that we passed in. So quick example, right? Uh, three to one vector, uh, you pass into the first argument in the map double, so to map over, and then I'm gonna pass in uh, chatty func, uh, chatty my func over the my vect, which is nine, four, one, uh, since you just square three, two, one. So that's your output. And you can use it in, uh, uh, Data, data frame setting or a table setting. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm mapping over a carb and I'm doing the exact same thing, chatty my func, and it's gonna give me all the chatty stuff along with the results stored in 16.16.1141, which is the squared uh, results of the carb. So yeah, that's a function of operators uh, and its definitions. Uh, anybody had any comments or questions before I move on to the existing ones. Okay, so there are two main function operators that that chapter covered, and they're from the per package and a memoize package. So let's look at the per safely uh, first, which is the majority of this chapter really. Um, so in a loop, before we actually dive into the, the function itself, uh, if you look at a for loop, um, whatever fails because maybe it's a different type, like the whoops, if you try and sum over the whoops, it's gonna fail, uh, but it will fail, uh, it won't fail for the first three arguments. So what's good about the for loops is it might give you an error statement because it actually fails, uh, you get to keep whatever was before, whatever didn't fail. If you print out an out, um, you actually get uh, previous values up until it fails. I had to uh, put the eval equals false in the code chunk for this presentation because it actually didn't run. But uh, if you were to run this on your console, it, it runs. Um, so yeah, that's really nice about the for loop, but not with functionals. It just fails right away. Mappable x sum, it doesn't give you anything. Now we can get around this problem with a per safely. 
And if you print per safely into the console, it, it's really simple. You pass in a function as .f, and you actually call an as mapper on it. So you make sure it's a function because you can pass in a formula as well, and you, you want to turn that into a function to use later. And then what you get out of is a function, another function that uses future arguments uh, with the function that you pass in. And if this fails, give me an otherwise. And there's also a quiet option, which I actually have a screenshot of. So that's how per safely is built. It try and do something. And if it doesn't work, it gives me an otherwise. So kind of like an if else almost. So yeah, uh, if I pass in the otherwise 9876, just to be uh, explicit about it, uh, the default argument is null. Um, this is what we get. Um, same thing, right? You, you do whatever the function you pass in is supposed to do. If it fails, give me 9876 and be quiet about uh, the operators while you do it. OK, so using the same vector, uh, whoops, vector that we looked up for, um, what you get is a list of length two. So one item is a result. That is the result of the function if it doesn't fail. So in, in our case, the first, uh, first x was a numeric vector, so it's going to work, and there's no error. But if we try and use a safe sum over the whoops, you um, you get an error uh, because it didn't work. And you get an otherwise 9876. And you get a bunch of different uh, details on your um, error conditions. And for the quiet argument, this is basically what it is. Like If you don't make it quiet, it's going to print out the error, invalid type of argument. And if you say quiet is true, which is default, it's not going to say anything. And with the this uh, safely function, you can now safely map over uh, our, our vector that is kind of faulty with this whoops. And this is the result you get. Um, so for every item in the vector, or sorry, list, you get a list up to um, result in an error if there is any. And as you can see, uh, the last item of the, item of the list that fails doesn't give you anything and it prints out a couple error messages. Now, to retrieve those results, the book goes over the transpose, which I'll cover in the next slide. But this is another good way to kind of extract those information out. You can use straight up map results over it, which I think Sham covered. Um, and then there's another useful function called per discard. And you pass in a predicate function. So whatever this is true, you discard. So if we go back. This is null, right? So the last, uh, last time. So the, this predicate is true. So you discard it, and as a result, you get uh, um, whatever worked out of uh, out of this operation. And further down the road, you can kind of map uh, for the second time to make it into a list. Uh, sorry, vector, and so on. And yeah, there's the transpose of the book covered, um, which turns everything inside out into a nice. One list uh, that has two items. Do you guys call this item in a list? Like if it's a result error, or is there a certain name for it? No? All right. Um, so yeah, you get, you get this. Um, first three is like we expect, uh, the result of the operation. And you get the null because it failed. And a use case for safely is web scraping, in my opinion. So here's a code chunk that I that I used. Um, so I'm using Arbest to kind of scrape the crane packages, uh, crane pages of the of some packages. And as you can see, the third uh, item is doesn't exist, right? So if I go, that works. Yeah, so this page exists, but this page doesn't because I pass in ggplot3 instead of 2. And if you were to scrape um, this description, which is uh, dot container h2, that's the uh, HTML tag for it. Uh, where's my slide? 
which is what I do. I read in the page, I, I grab this uh, particular node, and then I grab the text from it. So I'm grabbing uh, like this part of the HTML. Um, it's going to fail, right, on this page because there is none. Uh, yeah, there is no dot container uh, div and uh, an h2 that follows. So that's going to fail. So what, oh, by the way, these are some of the links that are super useful for web scraping. It's going to fail if you try and uh, map over them because it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work on the last one. Um, and unlike a for loop, it's not going to work because we're working with the functional here. But what you can do is you can map it over uh, or you can wrap it over uh, safely like so, get disk. Otherwise, I'm going to just say this failed. And once this runs, I'm going to, I'm just going to map character over it, the results uh, to grab a nice little uh, vector of, of, of length three. Uh, and when it fails, with a default value. So that's how I would use a safely function in, you know, like your everyday use case. Um, and yeah, that's as far as I went with safely. Does anyone have any comments or questions? Where are we grabbing result from? You're grabbing the result from? Or where it says map character result? Uh, these websites. Oh, um, this result is yeah. uh, this. Oh, okay. uh, sorry, right. this. OK. Yeah, so right, you can you can you can map over a list with a uh, whatever you pass in, and you grab a 1.39, 1.27, 2.17, and so on. Um, so yeah, that's the use case that I kind of wrote for this uh, for this chapter. Any other any other comments before I move on to memoirs? Which I'm going to call Shaman to uh, supplement some information. Okay. Memo eyes, that's how I pronounce it. Um, it's derived from a Latin word, memorandum, uh, which is which means to be remembered. And we usually say memo in, in American English. Um, so yeah, it memorizes previous inputs and returns cached results, which I'm not 100% clear on. Um, but this is how it works. Um, you grab a function that sleeps for a second and uh, computate some, some type of calculation. And if we time how long it takes to run, it's going to give me one second. And if I run the exact same thing for the second time, yet again, 1.02. So barely any differences. But if I wrap this whole thing in a memoize uh, called fast function, if I run it for the first time with the argument it's never seen before, same amount of time, 1.02 seconds elapsed. But if I run that for the second time, again, it remembers this result and it literally takes no seconds. So this was pretty cool to me. I don't know how this works. Shame if you can comment on that, that'd be awesome. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know how this works. Um, is that zero seconds? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Does this have something to do with this uh, lazy evaluation? Perhaps, or um, I wonder if you force the the evaluation of the function, whether it then uh, will change the or we run it again. Um, but but uh, I'm not sure. I I think that Memoize is creating essentially like a lookup table. So every every time you run a uh, fast function it'll remember that input and remember the output. And anytime it sees that input again, it'll just use the lookup table instead of actually running the function. So this kind of goes back to the, uh, the, the pure functions definition um, earlier in the functionals stuff. So for any, any so pure function is one that uh, will always return the same output for the same input. And you know, part of the definition of that is like, you, know, you can use a lookup table essentially to act like a function and that's what Memoize is doing. Like yeah, yeah. So I think um. So also um. Sometimes I when you said um use table uh, lookup table because it memo memo 
what do you call it? Memoise is sometimes called tabling. So I think um, it is really using the look of table to um, save time. It's one of the, an, an alternative name of it is called tabling in computing. Tabling. Huh. So it's actually creating a new object. Am I correct? Yeah, possibly, I guess. You can check with Lobster. But also Haskell does not support memories, memo, 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 <laughs> I even put it there, Shan. Memo highs. Okay. But yeah, that's interesting. Um, should I do the lobster now? Oh eh. yeah. Um, that's something I didn't know. Uh, so thank you guys. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it for memoized. Um, should post in the, okay. Yeah, I don't know what you would use this for, except for calculating things like this, right? Like when you need a previous value for your next calculation. So Fibonacci, like you take the uh, previous two iterations and you you, you sum them unless they're uh, zero and one. Um, so it's kind of like a recursive function, I guess, which is, which can be useful with memoize if you have a recursive function, I don't know. Um, so yeah, Feb 23, you, you, you grab the 23rd uh, Fibonacci series number. Uh, I don't know what that is, but it took me 0 0.1 second. And if you're on the 24th, it needs the 23rd and the 22nd. So it took 0.14 seconds, um, but if you, memoize it, it remembers the previous results. So all the way one through 2023. 20, so I, I call it for the first time, Fib 2, 23, um, takes a couple seconds. But if I run it for the second, uh, run it for the next sequence, it um, basically doesn't take any time because all the calculations were done here and it cached, uh, memoized cached results. Did I, did I do a good job explaining? Is that, is that how it works? I think so. I guess I'm curious why it's faster, even on the initial run, like when you wrap it against memoirs, memoirs. It is faster. It's like five times faster. Yeah. But I don't even know if that matters a lot. Much. Well, so it's, it's recursive. So uh, um, it's using the memoized fib2 in the, <laughs> this is where my, my knowledge of recursive functions falls apart. Oh, um, wait, you're right, you're right, it is. Yeah, so- oh, This so, is big rain. Like yeah, this. so like the in in that function when it's calling uh, um, on the second line of the of the body of the function when it's calling fib n minus two plus fib n minus one, in fib two, it's using the memoized version already. So even in that first execution of it, it's already, already using memoized, oh. already using the lookup table to get the value. So like in the original function, and this is, again, I'm going to explain this wrong because I'm recursive functions are not, I'm not good at them, but um, every, every time it's calculating the next number in the Fibonacci series, it has to recalculate all the previous ones. Whereas in the memoized version, it just says, oh, I've already calculated all those. I just look them up. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that true? So if I ran Fib 10,000, it's going to take too A long. really long time. Okay. <laughs> I'll start that now. I'll let you how, know how it goes by the end of the <laughs> Yeah, try yeah. both or just do a thousand. You can see it. Yeah, maybe we'll test it. Uh, we have tons of time, so. If I, if um. I disappear, I've crashed my machine. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how about this? I'll do Fib 2, you do Fib 1. Oh yeah, great. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but, um, I'm just wondering, thinking um, what the package parallel does. Um, do you know parallel package? Yeah. Um, does it have, I don't know, like uh, with this, uh, okay, there are two different things, right? But, but yeah, it's just from a different uh, package. Course. Yeah, they, it's running from different cores to speed up the process of uh, uh, very heavy tasks. But this one is, okay, yeah, they are different. Right. I guess you can use a fib2 function inside a map, like a functional, to make it a little faster to generate Fibonacci. Uh, yeah, you can you can do things like uh, 
uh, a function that takes max number of rows and you uh, initialize a df with a uh, one through one through uh, n and then you calculate Fibonacci over it and using the fib2 will be a lot faster I guess oh yeah I guess that will, I guess that'll work in the per too um so yeah that's as far as the actual contents go and then the book goes on and uh, make our own uh, functional operators. They did the web scraping, like downloading files uh, type of way, but I didn't want to download any files. So I made a gplot call with, um, safely. Or no, sorry, FOs. Um, yeah, so this is what I did, okay. Uh, delay by and dot every. Right, that's the that's what the book said, and I, I didn't do too much uh, modification. Play by is the exact same. You feed in uh, a function that you want to eventually eventually run, and the amount you want to sleep on, and of course you force them right away for evaluation, and then return a function. I I did this. I separated the uh, sleep in two. I just wanted to sleep it right before it executes and after it executes. But yeah, um, it it returns you a function uh, that does the operation that you pass in after sleeping a, a certain time and then sleep from a certain time again. And then hollow every, uh, it, it's basically dot every, but it's pretty funny with a, uh, I'll explain. <laughs> um, and then uh, I, I just draw a circle um, and it's, it's much easier to see this in action. Uh, what was it? Just a warning, it's gonna flash pretty quickly, ggplot. I, I, I make a bunch of ggplots really quickly, so just a heads up. Uh, my tidyverse. Tidyverse. Where are these things on your console that pop up every time? Oh, these guys? Yeah. It's in my our environment. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I don't know where I put it, but yeah, it's a, it's a package that you can use and they give you a nice little image and a little emotional support. So I, I have this pop up every single time <laughs> I open up an RCDO. But it changes every time, right? It's not the same. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So once you, yeah. uh, if you're working with like a, a blog down or like, something that refreshes, uh, like term, terminates and restarts are, it, uh, it gives you this every single time. It's pretty, pretty funny. It's cool. I can link the tweet to uh, the instructions. I love this. Anyways, uh, run delay by, holla every, and then I'm gonna make some plots. Also, I had a question on the holla every. Is there, is that super notation? Uh, line 384? Yes, so I can explain that a little bit. Um, Super assignment. Yeah, so what that is doing is every time we call on Hall Ivory, uh, you define a counter. And then when the function that you want to run runs, you go up an environment into here inside the Hall Every environment from this function and then add plus one. So you can kind of tell the function, hey, hey, if this hits, whatever, do some, do some action. That's how the dot every works. Um, dot every, whatever this n, um, this references the i that's defined in the environment above uh, to do some actions. Right, okay. All right, so I'll run some plots. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk over one, one and 50. Draw a circle, hollow every four, and delay by one second. Please work. Holla. I, I should go to plot. Holla. Holla, we them boys, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much uh, making a circle with uh, uh, these many dots. Um, and then every time you hit four, I, I holla. And if I hit 12, which is right, uh, n times three, I, I call them weed and boys. And uh, yeah, it gives you a nice little 
circle and it keeps going ha 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 and I'll, I'll pause here well yeah that's the idea um you can you can use function operators of your own to kind of uh i think this is really useful when you're trying to trying to understand how how things work so i'm sure you guys you know do print uh uh high stop or something like that in your in your like debugging steps like uh when you're trying to make uh cool function to work. Uh, I, I think uh, function operators can be a great tool for um, some immediate feedback when a function runs. And that's, that's it, short chapter for me again, but uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, cool, Digimon, excellent presentation. I'll try and uh, that tweet. So we are actually moving now to, we finished the second part of the book. We finished the functional programming now. All right. Um, we're going to jump to the... <laughs> oh, what happened? Oh, he's still running. <laughs> oh, he's still running? No. Stop. I, I wisely ran it on a different computer. <laughs> so that hasn't oh, killed did, me. Uh, oh, did Fed run, guys? Oh, Brett says he's still running. Oh. <laughs> I guess it takes a long time. Hmm. I was going to yeah, say, I, I will have spun it up on the TCP. So, um, I, I should have started smaller. <laughs> Although 100 doesn't seem like a very big N. I'm not sure how many times Bench does stuff, you know, repeats things by default. Yeah, it's probably pretty dirty. Now it does it. But it's pretty, so. So now we finished the first part of conditional and functional programming. Um, the next one is uh, object oriented. And I think um, we're gonna start with the first one, which is base type. And yeah, so uh, I think Adrian, you're the next one, right? Uh, I don't chapter. believe so. I oh, think okay. it's R3. Oh, okay, let me and see. R6. So we have Ryan as well here with the first that meeting today. So Ryan, you are welcome. Um, we have, I, I think I added you to our group for the Slack. You did, sir. Yeah, so uh, we have like um, presentation uh, schedule. So if you are comfortable with okay. any chapter, you can sign up um, to the chapter. Um, okay. Yeah, so you can sign up and prepare for the chapter. That's how basically we run the session. So each one of us volunteer the session, I think. Awesome. Yeah, so I'm sharing the link here as well. Okay, so maybe, thank you. Yeah, if you feel like you can choose any chapter. And I think the next week we're going to have, uh, let me see, uh, S3, oh, Hannes. Oh. In, in case, did, did he decide that he would do two weeks? Sorry? So because this is a new uh, concept, uh, mm -hmm. object-oriented programming, he made yeah. a poll saying if we want to do two weeks. Ah, uh, like, yeah. Let me just check what happened. But I think <laughs> we also have some issues. I think, oh, all right. I, I think the next chapter is chapter 12, um, base type, which hasn't been captured in the <laughs> presentation. <laughs> so we, we don't have anyone that sent off for that chapter for the next week. Oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> well, let me see. Yeah, and but I think it's not that it just might. I think I'm the one that caused this issue, but it's not. Oh, it's just, I think it's, I mean, this is nothing. It's just some small pages. So, any yeah. volunteer? Any volunteer for chapter 12? <laughs> I mean, it sounds like Hans wants to do both of these. Ah, okay. He, he wants want to do both. Okay. Yeah, let me, I'm checking the poll. It seemed like everybody voted oh yeah to split into two weeks so you can just make oh yeah 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 okay okay yeah 
so he, Hannes want to combine the bass and the stuff. That's fine. Okay. So we, we, are, we are good to go. <laughs> right. Mm. The chapters are becoming so small um, uh, <laughs> in subsequent chapters. Okay. Return oh, almost really? instantly. Okay. Oh, that's pretty cool. That is really cool. I'm glad I asked. I was like, oh, maybe it's just uh, something going on in the background. But yeah, that makes sense that it would be much, much faster. Yeah, like I've been slowly iterating up the numbers and uh, um, I, <laughs> I, uh, I 30 using an N of 30 returns on both of them, but uh, N of 40 is not returned yet. So I think that's like the wow. boundary. And at, at 30, um, it's taking um, a quarter of a second to run fib two and uh, two seconds to run um, fib. Wow, it's like eight times. Yeah, so has anyone uses these um, function operators before? Not, I mean, this chapter, because for me, this is the first time I'd even see it already. I mean, has anyone been using it and uh, what has some use case that he has used it? <laughs> I mean, like I was saying, like, I think it's a really good debugging tool if you don't know how to use like a debugger. Like, um, I don't know if you, if you would need to build a function operator. I think the book also says that, but uh, yeah, having some side effects to your pure function. I think this is what uh, function operators are really good for. Okay, cool. Yeah, because I mean, we're, we're printing stuff, we're like pausing, that's all side effects, right? Like we're not like calling another pure, uh, pure function or anything like that. Which actually makes me curious, like wondering if we can use function operators to not like print anything, like actually use a pure function, another pure function, like, would that make sense? Wait, could you repeat that? Yeah, so instead of, you know, pausing or printing dot every five seconds, whatever, after running the result, um, you, yeah, you have the res that you're gonna eventually return, but um, could you use another pure function instead of printing something out? to do some other action that'll still work. I don't know where I'm going with this, but. I, I think you can. There's a. So there's a package called targets. It's supposed to do something similar to memoize, if I recall correctly, or safely, um, where you can no, no, it's, it's, it's memoized, where you can cache certain results that you've done. Um, like if you've run the script before. I have to like look into it, but like somebody's forwarded to me because they said that if you're running a script weekly, you can use the targets package to basically not have it run on previous data, just have it run on the new data. It's basically like kind of like refresh it appended. So I feel like it must be doing something like memoize or, or caching mm -hmm. under the hood. Target is a cool package. I see um, it does have a lot of support because um, and good documentation. So, yeah. It's and a, I really go on. Oh, sorry, Shem, go ahead. Uh, sorry, sorry, I interrupted. I was just going to say it's a replacement, a R specific replacement for make. Um, and it was, you know, make came out of the same thing back when computers were really slow. You didn't want to compile things that if, if something was had the same inputs and would produce the same compiled output, you didn't want to compile it again because you're wasting your time. So make will check your inputs. If they're all the same, then it knows that the target's going to be the same. So it doesn't need to remake the target. So it's the same idea as memoization, just gone kind of like one level up. You know, on whole files instead of whole, although I think targets will work on on objects. I haven't, I haven't really played around with it that much.
there was there was something I was looking for. I, I know I saw it somewhere associated with the course. I'm not sure if it's in the book or not, but um, somewhere in the tidyverse, they I think they use memoize fairly often uh, under the hood places. And there was one place where they used it where um, it was a very odd bug where um, some like long running process. I should find the exact thing. Otherwise, this is just going to be confusing. But it was really interesting because it was a, a bug that was created by Memoize um, because, you know, something that you didn't expect to produce different output. So let, let's say you have an R process that's running for like, you know, a month or something like that. Um, and you're, you know, you change the content of a file or something like that, but, um, and you don't expect that to change in the duration of a process running. So you memoize with that file name, but then the contents of the file change. Then your memoize is no longer valid because the contents are not the same. So it's kind of like that, you know, I'll, I'll try to dig up the example because this is just kind of confusing without it, but it was really interesting that, that I think it's used under the hood in a lot of stuff. And there's like a couple places where it caused problems. Um, so I think um, this functional program in um, the first uh, section where we discuss the functionals is some is what is most widely used in R functional programming because I can see a lot of functionals are being used in R, but function factories and function operators are really used as hardly said from the book. Quite interesting. Okay, um, I think um, if we are done with the questions and discussion, uh, unless if you have something to discuss anymore, um, we can say we meet next week. Uh, yeah, and thank John for the presentation and uh, we're looking forward to Hannes for his presentation next week. Thanks everyone. Thanks guys. Thank you guys, see you next week.